morning, everybody, and welcome to our February 7th online worship service. We're so glad that you decided to join us today. Well, we're going to get started with a word of prayer this morning. Let's pray. God, we just thank you so much that we can be worshiping with our brothers and sisters, whether it's online or in person today. And Lord, I just thank you for the, the, the ability of technology that we can be brought together and still worship as one body. Lord, I just pray that you would uh, be with the service this morning. May our hearts and our minds be in tune with what you have for us. And may we can learn from uh, Pastor Dan's message of how we can encourage one another, especially in, in the pandemic where everybody's just kind of done with this pandemic. And Lord, I just pray that we could just share encouraging words with one another and, and brighten our spirits. Lord, we just thank you and praise you and give you today. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Eden Church. We're glad that you've chosen to worship with us online. I hope that uh, everybody's doing well, and it's just great to have you with us today. I have some things that I'd like to share with you this morning. Uh, we're still going to be collecting food for the seven baskets that we're preparing for Valentine's Day on the 14th, 
and we'll be continuing to collect food and or monies for meat and things like that until February the 14th or as long as February 14th. I also want to remind you about Faith Promise. Uh, Faith Promise uh, we had last Sunday. Uh, If you're at home and worshiping with us, you can make a Faith Promise pledge uh, just by addressing an envelope to the Eden Church. Attention, Penny Brownlee, just put on the paper inside the envelope, Faith Promise and an amount, and they'll be able to tally up uh, what they can expect uh, to get this year. So we wanted to make you aware of that. Also, I wanted to mention that next Sunday, Valentine's Day, uh, is going to be Communion Sunday. So when you're worshiping with us online, you're going to want to have some elements uh, ready <coughs> for whenever we celebrate the communion table together. Also wanted to mention that uh, uh, Chris and Susan Allen are stepping down from the Ministry of King's Kids. So we have a wonderful opportunity uh, right there uh, for someone to, to uh, help out or for a number of people to help us out with King's Kids. We don't know really what that's going to look like exactly yet, but we're anxious to get started. Uh, so you can look forward to that very, very soon. As far as prayer requests are concerned, I'd like to mention Linda A.C. Linda uh, had breast cancer 26 years ago and had been cancer-free. It turns out that it is back, and she is going to be seeing surgeons and doctors in Georgia where she's at right now. So you want to pray for Linda's family. We want to pray for Mark B. Mark B. is Paul and Candy's son-in-law, and he's been diagnosed with esophageal cancer. So please uh, be praying for them. Uh, Jill V. uh, had surgery on Wednesday and uh, is recovering from back surgery, and it was very, very serious, and we hope that she's doing well. We want to pray for Bob S. Bob has an upcoming heart procedure uh, to prepare a a leaking valve in his heart, so we want to pray for him. Ken S., Richard's dad, uh, is back in AFib, and he's seeing a number of doctors, I think a pulmonologist and a cardiologist, and they're trying to get uh, his heart rate to trim out and, and be more steady, so we want to continue to pray for that. We want to pray for Carrie J. and her son. They have uh, uh, COVID, and we're praying that they're recovering and doing quite well. I tried to check with her, but couldn't get a hold of her uh, this week yet. So please be in prayer for her. Continue to pray for Barb P. She's recovering from wrist surgery and has been doing very, very well. We want to pray for Davina R. Davina had that tumor and had to have follow-up uh, drain put in and things like that, and the tumor was benign, but she's home and thanking everyone for their prayers, and we want to continue to pray that she does well and has a complete and full recovery. Uh, I'd like to ask you to pray for uh, the family of my cousin, Judy M. Uh, Judy passed away uh, on Tuesday morning uh, from cancer complications, and she leaves behind uh, a father, a, 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 the, the dad, uh, her husband and a son and a stepson, and uh, this was out of the blue. Uh, it was complications uh, resulting from uh, her last chemo treatment, and uh, her, her passing was unexpected. So please be for, in prayer for the family and also for her mother, because when she went into the hospital, she had a spell. She's over 90 years, well over 90 years old, and uh, went into AFib right away. So now that she's passed, they're very concerned Uh, for her as she's a little bit fragile. So we want to pray for those folks. We want to pray uh, for our country. We want to pray for our nation. We want to pray for our community. Uh, We want to pray for all the adjustments that we're making as far as uh, COVID-19 is concerned and all the schools and as businesses open up and as we step back into life, how exciting uh, this is. We just pray for continued progress and, and for things to get better and better. So let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much uh, for who you are and that you love us and that you care about us. And Lord, what a great opportunity it is to gather together, whether in person or online. We can still be the body of Christ and the family of God, and we're very, very grateful for that. Lord, we pray for the ministry opportunity that we talked about for King's Kids, and we expect and know that that will go on because that's been such a vital ministry within the Eden Church, and we've got a great person and great kids that are involved. So uh, we're really excited for for what's going to happen there. Lord, we pray that uh, we can reach these seven families and bless them with the Valentine's food baskets. Lord, we pray that we're able to to do well with our faith promise giving so that we can bless people uh, locally and around the world in our missions, endeavors, and activities. And uh, Lord, we just are are grateful for all those things. Lord, we pray uh, for our people. We pray for the kids and the students and the teachers and the parents and everybody adjusting to a new normal at school or wherever. And Lord, I just pray for our our country and and, and our community and state uh, as we're in various stages of getting back and things are opening up and 
And Lord, help us to be disciplined for sure, but Lord, we're all anxious to, to step back into life more similar to the way we remember it and to really embrace life and live life. Lord, I, I hope and pray that we're appreciating much, much more this blessing, this gift of life that you give us. Lord, we have people we want to pray for. We think of Linda A. C. and the breast cancer situation and the fact that it's back. Lord, we just ask the blessing on the surgeons and doctors that she meets. Can they come up with a plan that just takes this away from her once again for another 26? years, Lord. That would be our prayer. Lord, we pray for Mark B. and lift him up as he's been diagnosed with, es diagnosed with esophageal cancer and just pray that it's treatable and that he'll do well and be healed. We pray for Jill Van Duzer and that her hope and pray that her back surgery has gone well. We pray for Bob Shepard for this upcoming heart valve situation and that uh, that can be repaired and his, that valve won't leak anymore. We pray for Ken S., that his uh, heart's going to trim out and, and hit more of an even beat and not be erratic and race or or uh, be all over the place. Lord, we pray for those recovering from COVID, and uh, we especially pray for Carrie, Carrie J. and her son. Lord, thank you for what you're doing in Barb P.'s life and, and healing her wrists and other injuries that she's had. Lord, we also praise you the fact that uh, Davina R. is back home with her family and kids and doing well, and we pray that that would only continue to do so. And Lord, we certainly pray for Judy M. and uh, her family and those that she leaves behind as her passing was uh, totally unexpected, Lord. A really great mom, and I'm sure that they're all missing her. So, Lord, bless the family. I don't even have any idea when services are going to be, but, Lord, please uh, bless them. Lord, we just ask your blessing uh, on the remainder of our service, our worship celebration today. May we bring you honor. May we bring you glory. May we bring you praise. Lord, hear our prayer, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Hi, have you ever heard the little phrase, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words may never hurt me? How many of you believe that? I don't believe that. How many of you believe that words can hurt people? I for sure believe that. You know, words can hurt people when they say mean things. I bet somebody's maybe said a mean thing to you, and if they haven't, great. But I bet if you asked your parents when they grew up, they can remember something that was said to them when they were a child that made them hurt. Maybe they were called fat or ugly or stupid or other mean things. The same way words can hurt people, words have the power to help people and make you feel good. In First Seth, Thessalonians 5.11, God tells us, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. You know, I looked up encourage in the dictionary. Encourage says it means to give hope or confidence or to give support or to help. So don't let anyone tell you as a kid that you are too young to encourage one another. When you get back to school and you hear somebody saying mean things or hurtful things to someone, you can tell them to stop. And you know, you adults can do that too when you hear people doing that at your work or wherever. You know, you can also do things to encourage people. Maybe you could send a note or a card or make pictures or... Um, uh, send them to family members or friends or neighbors or senior citizens or teachers. You know, I had an idea. What if you took some sticky notes and you put them around your house, like maybe on somebody's computer, great job, or how about way to go on something, or maybe on the mirror you could put, hello, beautiful, or maybe... You could put on your mailbox, God loves you, so when the post office person opens it up, they can see it. Or how about to the Amazon driver, you could put, you are loved. Or how about to the FedEx or UPS people, you are special. Or how about uh, to your neighbor, you can tell them that Jesus cares about you. Or how about to your own family members, your brother, your sister, your mom, or your dad, you can give them a note that says, love you. Or maybe you can do just something as simple as a smiley face. So you can help somebody feel encouraged or make them feel good. You can use the power of words to help someone, to encourage them, just like it says in 1 Thessalonians 5.11. God tells us to encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you're doing. So I would love to see this spread around your house then spread around your neighborhood, then spread all over the world so that we will use our words for good and help encourage one another. So take care. Have a great week. Bye-bye. Well, I certainly appreciate Colleen doing our Kids Devo today, and, and she did a wonderful job of setting us up again today uh, for the message because today's message is, is entitled Consider Encouragement. You know, I think that in some way, shape, or form, we could all really use some encouragement. And while I believe that all or most of us understand that the joy of the Lord can truly sustain and strengthen us, there are times when we all just flat out need or could use some encouragement. If you ever look around or you're paying attention, it's no surprise to you that this world is hard, and perhaps especially so on Christians again. And I say again because at Christianity's beginning, the world persecuted and despised Christians. Then for a considerable period of time, it was okay to be a Christian. And now it seems that Christians are once again in everyone's sights. Elijah, Jonah, and Job were at times suicidal. Paul, Jeremiah, and Jesus himself all had to deal with the sorrow of watching people destroy themselves, reject God, and reject his truth, which we know is the truth. My friends, I don't care how successful, well-adjusted, popular, or wealthy and influential you are. At times, we all need encouragement. <clears throat> Christian encouragement is intended to strengthen and fortify you and give you hope and help you become an encourager. It's not always easy to walk by faith in difficult times. It's not always easy to obey God when we know we should. It's not always easy to live according to God's will for our lives. It's not easy to cling to spiritual guidance and conviction when even other Christians are following and spiritualizing their own agenda or human logic. Sometimes we need some help, a little motivation to do what we know is right, to stand up for what we believe and to spread his word throughout the whole world. 
Each of us needs to be encouragement. Encouragement is awesome and amazing. It can actually change the course of another person's day, their week, and depending on the situation, sometimes their life. You will find if you just think for a moment, for just a little while, that the people that have influenced you for the good or or for your best are the people who believe in you the most, who have encouraged or are encouraging you. There are high spots in all of our lives, and most of them come about through encouragement, the encouragement of somebody else. No matter how famous or successful a man or woman may be, each hungers for encouragement. You know, correction does a lot. I mean, for sure. It helps. It keeps us in line. It it keeps us from going off the rail, and and it does guide us. But encouragement does even more. One of the most beautiful gifts in the world is the gift of encouragement. It is such a positive motivator. When someone encourages you, that person helps you over a threshold you might not otherwise have cleared or crossed on your own or by yourself. So let's take a look at today's passage as we consider encouragement. It's found in Hebrews 10, 23 to 25, and I'm sharing from the New International Version this morning. It reads like this. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we professed, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. At the time of the writing of Hebrews, there was life-threatening persecution. Our tendency during such trying times would be to save our own skin or make sure that we were looking out for number one. But the book of Hebrews makes it clear to us that we should encourage one another. Someone wrote, Encouragement is the kind of expression that helps someone want to be a better Christian, even when life is rough. To encourage is to inspire another with courage. In fact, Hebrews commands us in Hebrews 3.13, but encourage one another daily, as long as it's called today. Here, encourage is in the present tense, and it's meant to indicate a habit or a way of life. It is also in the active voice, so it means that we don't wait for others to encourage us, but instead, we take the initiative. We must encourage even if others cannot, or if others will not. And please take note, we are to encourage one another. That means that it's not only for pastors, but it's for every one of us. No one in the family of God is exempt from practicing the habit and gift of encouragement, the habit of encouragement. We are all meant to be encouragers, at least in some form. Hebrews 12, 3, 12 to 13. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. When a person is discouraged, when we fail to encourage, sin can deceive and harden the heart to the point that it becomes sinful and unbelieving, leading a person to turn their back on God. Someone wrote, people live by encouragement, Without it, they die slowly, sadly, and bitterly. That's so very true, and yet how sad that really is. So as we look at today's passage of Scripture, I want you to see first that we're to hold unswervingly. We're to hold without wavering. wavering. We're to hold tight. We're to hold fast to our hope. Hebrews 10.23, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. This is what we are strongly urged. This is what we're strongly advised to do. It is an urgent, an urgent appeal. You may even call it a warning. This is something we should do. The bottom line is this. We should never, we must never loosen our grip on what we believe. When we profess or confess Jesus Christ, it's a profession that any and all need to make if we would have eternal hope. Do you lack hope and expectancy? If so, You need to make good the profession or confession of your faith in Christ Jesus. Profess is to declare openly, admit, to freely affirm 
that you believe Jesus is God's unique, his one and only son, that he died on the cross for our sin, that he received the punishment that we deserved and purchased our pardon from sin and hell by his shed blood, and that he rose again, conquering Satan's sin, death, the grave, and hell, and that he ascended, returned to heaven, and that he is coming again for his own. And I know, because I've heard them too, there's those cynical voices that ring in our heads or that haunt us a little bit, trying to erode our faith. Materialistic voices get us too busy for God. The events of life seem to conspire against and shake our faith. Sometimes our faith, sadly, is even shaken by the words or conduct of, conduct of others we considered to have been mature Christians. But we who confess Jesus are to persevere in and by giving constant confession and profession of faith and hope in Jesus. <clears throat> Perseverance in confessing and professing Christ is the evidence that we have received the promise of God. If our hope is based on the unfailing promise of God, we should confess and profess it confidently and boldly. Has God ever failed us? <clears throat> now I know, sometimes it seems so in the short term, but not in the long haul, as the final chapters have not always been written, and when they are, God will write them. God is faithful to his people and to his promises for all who draw near to him in faith. To hold unswervingly, hold fast, without wavering or hold tight, has the sense of holding firm, securing and tightening down our profession of hope. That is, <clears throat> we must do so without wavering, you know, <clears throat> going back and forth or being swayed one way and then another. We must not go off balance or become erratic or rocked as, as in a faulty foundation or askew as in an earthquake. We are not supposed to bend and yield to the winds of pressure that blow on us from seductive yet a still hostile world. There is a reason to hold fast and unswervingly even when the circumstances of life seem to be haunting us. Even when things have become difficult and the moment we feel there is little reason to keep on keeping on, the one who made the promise the one who made the promises, he is faithful and will not let us down. He does not count time in the short segments that we tend to. Therefore, we shouldn't let momentary or temporary discouragement cause us to turn away. So hang on, hold fast, don't let go, and don't give up. God is on his way with resources for endurance. <clears throat> though things could become even more difficult for a time, remember Hebrews 12.3. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. God uses the very process of enduring to discipline and strengthen you to grow his rich fruit in your life. The tragedies, heartaches, struggles, and troubles will become the triumphs of tomorrow. Romans 8, 26 to 28 reads like this. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. God is faithful, and he is faithful to his promises. I have an illustration I'd like to share with you. A young trooper admitted, paratrooper, a young paratrooper admitted that he had been scared the first time he jumped. <laughs> yeah, who wouldn't be? There was nothing but a piece of fabric, when you think about it, between him and death. What if the, fa the fabric accidentally ripped apart? What if his ripcord, when he pulled it, didn't work and the parachute failed to open? What if when it did deploy that parachute, it got all tangled up and he dropped like a spiraling rock? But when he jumped, everything functioned just as it should. It functioned perfectly. Supported by the life-preserving umbrella over his head, the soldier floated harmlessly down to earth. He said, I had a release from fear 
and a marvelous feeling of exhilaration. <clears throat> what about the promises God makes in the Bible? Will they uphold us in times of crisis? It all depends on whether we believe them to be God's promises or simply printed words, you know, scratches on paper, or just the guesses of fallible human beings who are just like ourselves. Because they are the promises of God, we can cling to them with 100% assurance. This will bring relief from fear and bring about a forming deep inner peace. Throughout the ages, our God has been, has been trusted millions and millions and millions of times, and he has never been proven untrustworthy. So let's trust him and add our personal testimony to that of the countless hosts of fellow believers who have found that our promise-keeping God is unfailingly faithful. Second, I'd like us to see that we are to encourage one another. In Hebrews 10, 24, and 25, it says, And let us consider how we may spur one another on or stir up toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. You see, verse 24 makes an urgent appeal for us to put our minds to the task of assisting and helping others in their Christian life. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Consider, spur one another on, means to observe attentively or understand. It is to fix your eyes or mind on something or someone. In short, we're to focus on encouraging one another. It's not to be accidental. It's supposed to be intentional. The message puts it like this. Let's see how inventive we can be. Let us think of creative ways to encourage one another. The real emphasis here is on getting to know one another in our community of faith. The result is a synergy of creative interchange that leads to the progression and stimulation of both love and good works or good deeds. When a person is really known for all that they are, with all of their wrinkles, with all of their faults, with all of their scars and imperfections, and yet is loved, or loved anyway, or loved in spite of all that stuff, trust is produced, and creative risking becomes a possibility. A freedom in the community to try, to stumble, even fail, exists. In that kind of environment or community, we can say, so what if I fail making a good attempt? I will still be loved. I'm confident of that. I know it. He or she knows me and still loves me. I can tempt my idea. I can attempt this or that without fear. This, then, makes for fertile ground one of the purposes of the Christian life, good works and deeds. Such good works do not always come naturally or even automatically. We're challenged and urgently requested by the author of Hebrews and we don't know who the author is. There's about a dozen people that have been purported to be the author or been suggested. But we are, we are requested by the author of Hebrews to both love and good works and deeds. <clears throat> and then verse 24 continues. It says, And let us consider how we may spur one another on or stir them up. Now to spur uh, on <clears throat> means to stir up or provoke or stimulate or incite. Could even be a challenge. You know, someone is encouraging you to embrace a challenge, or someone is encouraging you to do something you don't think you can do, but they see that ability within you. They know that you're capable of it. They know that you can do it. And so they encourage us to stretch ourselves beyond what we can think to embrace what God has created us to be. They're encouraging somebody to do something. In other words, it's to create a thirst or a motivation for something. A thirst for what, maybe? Well, how about moving toward love? and good deeds. That's how we're to measure encouragement. It, it is more than some fuzzy feeling. If someone becomes a more loving person or a better person, then we really have encouraged them. And honestly, I have to admit, some of you don't even realize how incredible you really are. And I know church can be a great place to get caught up on the latest football game. In fact, I actually think there's there's a football game, that, a pretty big one, that's, that's going to be on today. It's a great place to catch on, up on the golf scores and family news and, and health concerns or, or just to visit with friends, you know, your spiritual family. Maybe have a cup of coffee together and share a warm friend shake, a, a friendly pat on the back, hopefully possible in a season or so. 
And that's all part of the social interaction we need. We really need as human beings. And let's shoot straight here. I mean, let's, let's really lay it right on the line. That's partially why we may all be a bit starved or thirsting for some encouragement during this extended, se- extended season of social distancing. It's def- it definitely has hindered and strained the best ways that I connect with other people. But while all this stuff that we just talked about is really good, the New Testament fellowship goes much de- deeper than merely socializing when we get together as, at a, as a church. It takes place when we consider how we can lift up, how we can build up, how we can brighten up our brothers and sisters in Christ. Christian fellowship takes place when we offer encouragement to our friends, when we pray for them, when we confess our sins and weaknesses to one another, which takes a serious level of comfort and trust to the point that genuine accountability takes place. These are the elements that make fellowship sincere. So what about this church? What about Eden? Are we just socializing? Or are we practicing true Christian fellowship? Well, in normal times, I have to admit, I I think it was easier, whatever normal times were, whenever we weren't having to social distance and wear masks and and wash our hands 150,000 times a day. But there are still healthy pockets of this true Christian fellowship taking place right now, mostly in small group interactions and in online settings. Christian fellowship builds up, and it binds us together. Now, of course, we've all heard someone complain or criticize that that people in a certain church, they're just not that friendly, or they, they seem to be lacking in love over there. And although such criticism may be true, the one doing the complaining is often a part of the problem. You know, when I worked at an environmental consulting engineering firm before coming to Eden, we used to do some water dye testing to find out what pipelines were connected below ground and, and where they went. Well, that required a significant amount of water to get enough flow, so we often needed <clears throat> a pump. But you know what? The pump didn't work just because, you know, you gassed it up and you fired that pump up. It didn't necessarily pump water. You had to prime that pump with a bucket of water to help the pump get started for it to work at all, really. And you're wondering, well, now, what does that have to do with anything? Well, to grow or develop an atmosphere, an environment, a community of love and friendliness in the body of Christ for believers, we may need to pour a bucket of our own love in first. Think about it. It was God who first loved us, which prompted our love in return. And this principle also works in our relationships with other Christians. So why not give it a try? Your expression of love and concern and friendliness will almost certainly stimulate a reciprocal expression of love from hearts indwelled by God's Spirit. When you meet together with the people of God, ask Him to help you prime the pump. The third thing I'd like us to take a look at today in our passage with regard to considering encouragement is assemble together. Hebrews 10.25 says, Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. So the stimulating and urging is to include people getting together in worship which admittedly is seriously challenging just now. I mean, look again. The passage says we should not abandon or give up meeting together to forsake or leave behind or desert their gathering together in worship. That's a serious danger right now in the COVID era. Of course, if people don't feel safe here, then worshiping with us at home online is the best we and the best they can do, of course. But, but sadly, experts are telling us that as many as one-third of our church family may never return to in-person worship. Well, I pray that isn't so and that they're wrong. But I have to admit that I do feel that some just aren't really with us, and I'm not sure that they're with anyone, and, and that's not good. It's not best. But sadly, I fear that in their hearts, many have already chosen to disengage from the local body of Christ. But you cannot be stirred up by love and ministry if you stay away from worship in the Father's house or, or, or in this era, even online with the body of Christ. Even before COVID-19, attend, attending church had fallen on hard times. For some Christians, it has become a weak substitute for a picnic on a rainy day Sunday. Excuses are as plentiful as the seeds on dandelions. The fact is that many professing Christians don't seem to think church is all that important. 
They think they can be perfectly good Christians without being a part of or engaged and connected in the local church, the local body of Christ. But I'm pretty sure God doesn't agree with them. For one thing, our own spiritual welfare is not to be our only concern, even though many selfishly approach it that way. We go to church and are the church, not just to get and not just to receive, but to give, to spur on other Christians to love and good works and deeds. And if we stay away or we disengage, we may give others an excuse to be careless or flippant. They may imitate our habit of not meeting together. Now, granted, take this with a grain of salt, all this in, in, with a grain of salt in the COVID era. But on the other hand, if we are enthusiastically engaged, we encourage other believers in their ambition to draw near to Jesus. If we are faithful in gathering, if we are faithful in meeting together with them, we honor the Lord, grow in our faith, and give a strong witness and testimony to the world around us. Hayden Robinson once wrote or said, The Christian faith makes no allowances for rugged individualism. To have a fire, you need more than one coal. You also need a spark and a draft of air. One humble, open, involved individual, maybe you, set on fire by Christ, can be the spark. And the Holy Spirit, the breath of God, may blow on that spark and set the congregation spiritually ablaze. Our hearts are sometimes cold. Fellowship can kindle warmth and make our witness bold. End of quote. If we are honest, we must say that fellowship builds us up and binds us together. You know, nowhere in the Bible does it say that the names on a church membership roll means we're saved. That doesn't mean, however, that joining with other believers in a local church is not a vital part of our spiritual growth. You know, gathering regularly for worship and instruction encourages our love for others, good works, and also for mutual accountability. An article from some time ago related a Christian without a church to the following things. A Christian without a church is like a student who won't go to school, or a soldier without an army, a citizen who won't vote, a seaman without a ship, a child without a family, a drummer without a band, a ball player without a team, a honeybee without a hive, and a scientist who does not share their findings with their colleagues. Please, don't neglect one of God's greatest provisions for your spiritual growth. Get into God's Word and be committed and dedicated and a faithful part of God's church. Don't be a churchless Christian. Get involved. Be engaged. Remember the church is the bride of Christ. It's important to him. Someone once said, and I don't know who, seven days without church makes one week. W-E-A-K. We need to encourage each other in living the Christian life. How many times have we seen people who didn't find a relational, small, or discipleship group leave the gatherings of the church, whether from a lack of, of warm fuzzies or because of judgmentalism, some have left out worship and instruction. It's no longer part of their lifestyle. Worship is potentially the event in which we can become radioactive for God. When we are not in collective worship, engaged in worship with God's people, we have missed an opportunity. We have missed an opportunity and an exposure to God, having missed it, and we lose our radiance. A chief of radiology at the National Institute of Health received a new cyclotron for making radioactive elements that could be used to create radioactive isotopes used in diagnostic scanning equipment or in radiation therapy. Some of the elements have a short half-life of radioactivity, so they must be used within a few minutes of their creation. The cyclotron, and therefore the patient, needed to be in close proximity to one another for them to be effective. Well, Christians are like short-lived radioactive isotopes in that we have a really short half-life. Get us away from the worship of God with other saints, and our radioactivity has a tendency to dissipate quickly, and we lose our effective radiance. The circumstances of our world today 
intensify our need for maximum strength radiating from the lives of the believers. Christ is the radiance of God, and we must constantly be in a worship relationship with him and with other Christians. We usually use this verse that we're talking about right here to remind people to be faithful in attending worship services. Yet note the conjunction, but, because it gives us a strong contrast between clauses. Let us not give up meeting together, and then, but let us encourage one another. That means that even if we attend worship celebrations, if we fail to encourage others, we have not yet obeyed this verse to its fullest extent. Encouragement is a purpose of our meeting together, whether, whether it is a worship celebration or a small group gathering. I shared this illustration a long, long time ago, but it's appropriate here again today. Have you ever wondered why Canadian geese fly only in a V formation? Well, for years, specialists in aerodynamics wondered the same thing. Two engineers calibrated in a wind tunnel what happens in such a V formation. Each goose is flapping its wings, and it creates an upward lift for the goose that follows it, increasing the flying range of the flock, and each depends on the other to get to its destination. From this illustration of the V formation with the flying geese, we get at least five lessons on the benefits of encouragement. Fact number one, as each goose flaps its wings, it creates an uplift of the birds that follow. So by flying in a V formation, the whole flock adds 71% greater flying range than if each bird flew alone. So think about that. You know, if, if they're able to fly 100 miles by themselves, if they're flying in a V, they can fly 171 miles. That's almost twice as far. So that's amazing. They, they need the momentum of the others. The lesson we get is people who share common direction, as Christians should, and a sense of community can get where they're going quicker and easier because they are traveling on the lift and the momentum of one another. Second fact, when a goose falls out of fall formation or falls away from the formation, it suddenly feels the additional drag and resistance of flying alone. And so it quickly moves right back into formation to take advantage of the lifting power of the bird in front of it. So the second lesson we get is, if we have as much common sense as a goose... We stay in formation with those headed where we want to go. We are willing to accept their help and give our help to others. <clears throat> Fact number three. When the lead goose tires, it rotates back into formation and another goose flies into the point position. So the third lesson we get is, is that it pays to take turns doing hard tasks when leading. And as with geese, people are interdependent on each other's skills, on each other's gifts, their capabilities, and unique arrangements of talents and resources, okay? Fact number four, when geese fly in formation, they honk to encourage those up front to keep up their speed. So we get a lesson from that too. We need to make sure our honking is encouraging. Sometimes our honking can be discouraging or can be complaining or whining or, or criticizing. That's not the kind of honking we're looking for here. We're looking for encouraging honking. In groups where there is encouragement, the production is always greater. The power of encouragement, that is to stand on one's heart or core values and encourage the heart and the core of others, is the quality of the honking we seek, which should be a motivating, a positive, motivating, uh, encouraging factor. Fact number five. When a goose gets sick, wounded, or shot down, two geese drop out of the formation and follow it down to help protect it. They stay with it until it dies or is able to fly again. Then they launch out with another formation or catch up with their original flock. So the lesson that we get for lesson five is, if again, if we have as much sense as the geese do, we will stand by each other in difficult times as well as when we are strong. So let's learn from God's animal creation. The church needs a phi and a spiritual V for victory formation. Honking, not criticizing or complaining uh, for, to one another into persistent, determined dedication and commitment, encouraging us to be those things, persistent, determined, dedicated, and committed. And it must be 71% easier to live the faithful Christian life flying with the flock as opposed to going at it alone. 
Instead of forsaking the worship, let us consider one, one another and all the more as we see the day approaching there in verse 25. Is that day a day of heightened persecution or is it the last day of history? We need to encourage others so that we do not cast aside our faith and confidence in the face of severe pressure. Now is the day. Now is the time to encourage even more. You know, I don't know the day or the hour. I just don't. I have no idea when that's going to be. I don't know the day or the hour. But even a cursory look around reinforces the fact that it approaches. That it approaches. And logic alone underscores that it's closer today than it was yesterday. William Barclay wrote, It is easy to laugh at men's ideals. It is easy to discourage others. The world is full of discouragers, criticizers, whiners, and complainers. We have a Christian duty to encourage one another. Many times a word of praise or thanks or appreciation or cheer has kept a man, kept a person on their feet. Blesses the man, blesses the person who speaks such a word. God asks us to hold without wavering, to hold tight, to hold fast with loyalty to our hope in Jesus Christ. We need the encouragement of God's people to help us become strong and vibrant Christians. Attending church regularly for mutual encouragement, fellowship, and building each other's other up is a means of receiving and giving this kind of support. In this world, full of its divisiveness, full of its discouragement and criticism, it is our duty to help one another gather in the house of God and to stir them up to love and good deeds, to to love and ministry and mission. Are you actively involved in encouraging people to gather together in small groups or studies or ministries and missions, literally together as in God's house or the church or or in these times, virtually, online. So the question is, why not begin today? We all have the duty to be an encourager. We all are called and urgently urged to encourage one another. It's kind of the lifeblood of true fellow Christian fellowship. There is a a saying here I'd like to say with you that is called the cadet maxim. When I ask the question, why not begin today, I'd like to share this. The maxim goes like this. Risk more than others think is safe. Care more than others think is wise. Dream more than others think is practical. Expect more than others think is possible. So today, I challenge you with that and encourage you to be a blessing, to be an encourager, and to be an encouragement. So consider encouragement. Let's all bow our heads and have a word of prayer in closing. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. And Lord, I'm grateful for that passage that uh, really has some important things for us to consider when it comes to encouragement. Lord, help us to be encouragers of one another by the things we say, by the things we do, by being there for one another, by being willing to make sacrifices and sometimes be inconvenienced, uh, to stand alongside and be inside or be beside a brother or sister in Christ. Lord, help us to hold fast. Help us to do that. Help us uh, you know, to be right there and encouraging one another and attending with one another and supporting one another and, and really being the family of God. And uh, Lord, help us not just to encourage those in the body, but also be such an encouragement and a breath of fresh air compared to the world, that when people see the way we lead our lives, that our faith is true, that it's anchored in Jesus Christ. And Lord, that there's something different about Christians. We're not the same as the world around us. We're not like everybody else. There's something different, and it's so different that it's something that they want to be a part of, that they want to be a part of the family of God and part of the kingdom. So Lord, today I thank you for all the folks that are here with us online. I pray that they've received the message and that they'll be applying it to their lives. Lord, help us to remember uh, the things that we should do and that we represent you. We are ambassadors for Christ. Lord, next week is Valentine's Day, and we're going to be celebrating communion. So help remind our folks that uh, next week we're going to be celebrating communion so that they have the elements ready and waiting. And Lord, I just pray that uh, they'll all be back online with us next Sunday as we begin a two-part series on being secretly incredible. 
Lord, bless your people. May it be a great week in which we have to live and encourage others and represent you well. We thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen.